your reaction you. to the Rubles' performance? And do you think Western leaders are, are worried that their sanctions don't seem to be working thus far? Yes, I mean, the sanctions have clearly uh, had a significant impact, but not of the type that perhaps a lot of the European leaders uh, were, were aiming for, uh, at least following their official statements. They want to hurt Russia, but they're hurting uh, the European economies and European consumers. And it's just the beginning of that pain. Uh, we are seeing a, a dramatic switch from what used to be fairly free market economies to a Soviet style system uh, in Western Europe, um, whereby you know regulations, restrictions, quantitative uh, rules, sanctions um, are imposed and um, you know investors or just normal market participants, traders, business people can't get on with their work and their, their business because of these uh, rules and restrictions from some uh, bureaucrats and Soviet style rulers that seem to be based in, in Washington actually quite interestingly. So do you think this is just a temporary high for the ruble or do you think, um, well, how long do you expect it to last? It's not a temporary uh, development. We've, we've seen a significant fundamental and historic point in the ruble, I believe. Um, on the day uh, President Putin announced the very smart policy that um, henceforth the, um, the bias of Russian um, energy exports, gas, uh, oil, various supplies um, of uh, fossil fuels will have to pay in the Russian currency. This is actually a mechanism that uh, many market participants know from the 1970s. You know, in the early 70s, the US dollar uh, was in free fall after 1971 August when uh, the US government essentially defaulted on its obligations to change dollars into gold. And then, you know, the, there was a free float and everyone sold the dollar. Everyone was fleeing from the dollar because the US also had a huge uh, trade and current account deficit. So then there was a lot of thinking going on in the US. How can we strengthen the dollar? And they came up with this much more complicated plan. What, what do the big exporting nations need? Uh, Germany, Japan with huge trade surpluses. They needed very little from America, but they needed energy imports, oil. And so then they had this deal with Saudi Arabia and then other oil exporters to only sell oil against the US dollar in exchange for military protection and, and, and so on. And from then onwards, the, uh, the dollar strengthened. Of course, at the same time, um, various measures were put in place by central banks um, to, uh, to support this policy in the West. Now, for Russia, it's much easier to do this because Russia is an exporter of very badly needed oil, oil and gas um, in particular to Europe. And so by demanding that uh, this is paid for in rubles, you create significant demand and this is structural demand in the rubles. So I think the ruble will continue to rise. Let's also not forget that actually fundamentally, even before um, the sudden very brief uh, but very dramatic fall in the ruble in late February, early March, uh, before then, the ruble was actually undervalued. It should have been stronger. And the sort of weakness of the ruble started with the earlier sanctions up to 2014, 15. And that had been largely politically motivated. Russia didn't react because Russia just let, um, you know, market forces guide this, but there weren't really market forces. There were already Western interventions um, and restrictions. Also Russian uh, national debt, uh, government bonds, um, I already thought, you know, last year and the year before were really undervalued. And I think what we're now seeing is people recognizing this and uh, we're getting back to the true value of the ruble and Russian assets, which has been much higher, or should mm. be much higher than it has been. Uh, Richard, it seems like some kind of twisted irony that the Western countries that imposed all these sanctions against Russia in the first place are now experiencing spiraling inflation and, and prices at home. What do you expect them to do next? Well, if they were rational, they would um, they would analyze the situation and conclude, OK, this is really not achieving any particular result vis-a-vis -vis Russia. 
Um, you know, and that's clear to everyone looking at the situation. Russia is not changing its policy vis-a-vis -vis the Ukraine based on this, that's for sure. So what is the effect? It's, it's to actually completely damage and potentially annihilate um, major economic power sources such as Germany and, and the German industrial sector. Therefore, let's quickly reverse this policy. Now, this would be if we lived in a rational world, also where Europe and European leaders had some decision-making leeway. But as I said earlier, it seems they don't. I mean, they, they, they don't seem to be able to take uh, independent decisions, and they have to follow what, what the U.S. is telling them. And the U.S. doesn't seem to care. Now, that's actually something that they should also think about. How come that is so expensive to be an ally of the United States of America. Perhaps these costs mm -hmm. are getting too high. And perhaps this is the hope we have that Europeans will start to think, well, you know, really this, this uh, what the, our leaders are doing is just following the US down into the abyss. And this is really not uh, working. We need some bigger changes, including of perhaps the, the, the government and so on. Um, so, that's, I think, the only hope we have at the moment. Mm. It just seems like the, you know, the unprecedented seizing of Russian assets in the US and Europe really hasn't helped the economies of those countries either, has it? Uh, that's right. That's right. Of course, you know, there's, there's, it's, there's been PR measures. This is trumpeted in the, in the Western media. Uh, you know, billionaires' assets seized and will redistribute them, whatever. But, um, you know, the US seized the Afghan foreign exchange reserves and they're going into some very murky channels, and we're talking about billions there as well, and that happened earlier. So that was really quite worrying. Uh, and what happened to Russian citizens, or even people that are citizens of now other countries, but of Russian ethnic origin, or used to be Russian citizens, just stealing their property, um, I mean, you can make a case for it, but then actually you're making a case for ending the rule of law. And that seems to be what we're witnessing in, in mm. Western Europe in particular, um, and that is highly concerning. Um, there's so much arbitrary uh, sort of dictatorial intervention that is um, not based on the rule of law anymore that that probably could be the highest cost we're seeing, that the end of, um, of lawful government in, in Western Europe. Mm. Uh, Richard, going forward, how do you expect Russia to navigate the ongoing pressure of Western sanctions? And how could Moscow consider adjusting its economic strategy? Yes, well, Russia, as the largest country in the world, endowed with um, an abundance of natural resources, land, um, and actually, you know, a fairly large population that is quite well educated with high educational standards, um, the scientific sector very advanced. It's quite clear Russia is, you know, if, if you were to choose a country that had to be isolated because of foreign sanctions, Russia is a pretty good one to choose. So I think Russia has still many options. Of course, also, let's not forget that these sanction, sanctions are mainly imposed um, by the US on its vassals. But there are many countries that are not part of the US empire. And Russia, of course, will increase trade with those countries. And that includes many countries in many parts of the world, whether Africa, some in Latin America, in, um, in, in Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, Far East. There's many options for Russia. And many countries are, you know, they, they take a more neutral stance and they say, well, of course, we'll continue to trade with Russia because there's always skirmishes, have, you know, there have been sort of uh, wars going on, particularly arranged by the United States of America, that the U.S. has been involved in for half a century. So many countries will not be too phased by what's going on, uh, because that's actually been, you know, daily business as far as the U.S. is concerned to intervene in other countries. The only difference being that when the U.S. does it, the countries seem to be very, very far away from the U.S., uh, whereas here it's it's about um, a neighbor, so uh, Russia will expand its trade with other countries that uh, don't follow this uh, U.S. imposed sanction regime, and has enough options for the economy to continue to do well. While also, of course, following this policy of import substitution, I've written about this before. After the sanctions, after 2014-15. The Russian economy has actually benefited from the sanctions because it's forced many um, many sectors to produce more at home. 
And as a result, in many industries, Russia has moved up the value added ladder um, and has begun to move away from simply exporting uh, you know, resources and has become an economy that is offering much more, much more wider range of goods and services that previously had to be imported. And I think that trend will also continue. And, and I think Russia will do well based on that.